All right, here we are again in our small group uh, discussion series entitled uh, Understanding and Obeying the Ten Commandments. We're at lesson number four in this series. Uh, we're going to cover uh, command number three and the name of this lesson is the holy name, the holy name. So uh, the Ten Commandments uh, were referred to in various ways in the uh, Old Testament. For example, in Exodus 20 verse one, uh, the writer refers to them as the words. Uh, and then in Deuteronomy chapter five, verse 22, uh, another reference to them as the words of the covenant. We read in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, that they were written by God himself and given to Moses uh, on the uh, Mount of Sinai. Moses, uh, if we remember the story, Moses returned from the mountain with the commandments and he found the people worshiping a golden calf fashioned by none other than Aaron, uh, Moses' brother. So we read in Exodus uh, chapter 32, verse 19, it came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger burned and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. So here it says that Moses broke the original tablets that had God's command, he broke them in anger when he saw the people had you know, uh, given, a, given uh, themselves uh, up to idolatry and that even his brother Aaron had been involved in that. And so we find out that God uh, gives Moses a second set of commandments which were eventually deposited in the Ark of the Covenant and kept in the uh, holy of holies. Uh, we read about that in Exodus uh, 34, chapter one, uh, all the way to chapter 40, verse 20. Um, eventually the commandment, the tablets themselves were, were lost. Now there are different opinions as to how the commandments were actually separated on the tablets. How were they written on the tablets? First of all, the custom at the time uh, for the declaration of laws at the time of Moses, for the declaration of laws by a king was that two copies were made, one for the king and one for the people. Uh, scholars are fairly uh, certain that according to the custom of the period, God fashioned two writing tablets of stone. All the 10 commandments were on a single tablet front and back and there were two of these. Both were then put into the ark since this is where God and man kind of met in the Jewish religion. The concept that some commandments were on one stone and then some were written on the other uh, stone led to many uh, ideas and some uh, thought that um, uh, this is how they were divided. In other words, uh, scholars uh, tell us that all 10 commandments were on one tablet and there, were a, there was a copy, if you wish. Two, two tablets had the same information. Uh, for a long time, they thought that you know, maybe commandments one to four or one to three or whatever were on one, command, one tablet and then commands of four to 10 were on, uh, another, uh, on, uh, on another tablet. Uh, Augustine, um, for example, in the, and, and of course this idea that the, the, commands, the commandments were split you know, onto two tablets, this led to a lot of other speculation. For example, Augustine, a fourth century theologian, supposed that there were three commands on one tablet and seven on the other. And he was the one who grouped the first and second command into one command and then divided the 10th commandment into two commands, a division that the Roman Catholic Church uses to this day. Later on, Protestant theologians, uh, Calvin, for example, in the 16th century, as well as modern scholars have grouped them into four and six uh, respective uh, tablets. This accommodates length, uh, it divides the duties uh, to God and man, and it also reduces well to two basic commands, as Jesus said in Matthew uh, 22, verse 34. So let me give you another image of that. Um, Augustine and the Roman Catholic Church, if you ask them to show you the Ten Commandments, how they thought they were divided, you'd have the first command is God uh, and the images. Uh, the second command is about God's name, third command the Sabbath, fourth command obedience to parents, then murder, adultery, theft, lies. Uh, ninth command, 
you mustn't covet goods. Tenth command, you mustn't covet your neighbor's wife. Uh, later on, Calvin and the uh, Protestant theologians divided the commandments in the way that most of us find them in our Bibles today. Uh, the first one, God. The second one, uh, the prohibition against images. The third one, the warning about using God's name. The fourth one, uh, about the Sabbath. Uh, the fifth, obedience to parents. Sixth, murder. Seventh, adultery. Eighth, uh, theft. Nine, lies. And the tenth is uh, against coveting, whether it be your neighbor's goods or your neighbor's, your neighbor's, uh, your neighbor's wife. So division notwithstanding, uh, these were not totally new ideas. So I just gave you some information about how they were divided and you know, some of the thinking about that. But the commandments themselves, when they were given, were not necessarily new ideas. The commands, for example, uh, concerning the treatment of other people were already incorporated in uh, Egyptian legal codes, for example. Uh, the command to respect God's name was also followed by the more enlightened cultures uh, in their uh, religious uh, practices of the day. What was truly new were the first, the second, and the fourth commands. The first, to worship only one God because only one existed. This was new. This was new. The, the, the Jews, uh, you know, the Jewish people, especially at the time uh, of Moses, lived among peoples uh, that were polytheists. They had many, many gods, okay? So that there was only one God, this, this was a new idea. Secondly, to refrain from characterizing God with idols and images, this also was new. Uh, because so many, you know, in the, in the land of Canaan, for example, where the Jews were, were going, uh, all the religious uh, practices involved uh, idols, objects of, of, of worship. And then to set aside a particular day every week for the worship of God, this was new and it was particular to the Jewish people, all right? The cultures of that time, I mean, there was one day was like the other. There was no one day in the week, if you wish, that was uh, special and certainly not one day set aside simply for the worship of God. So altogether, the commandments summarize the basic moral responsibilities that men had toward each other and it introduced the true nature of God and an acceptable way of addressing him. And all of this was given to man with the accompaniment of miracles in order to confirm the truth and the uh, authority of the individual God who was uh, giving these commandments to mankind. Now, the third command, which is what we're going to look at today, says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. So Exodus 27, note another command that states the ordinance and then the punishment for failure to comply. And so we need to understand a little bit about names uh, and the significance of names, uh, especially in the Jewish culture. Um, to properly understand this command, we have to understand the role of names in Jewish and other ancient cultures. For these people, as well as indigenous cultures uh, here in America, a person's name represented that person's heritage, his character, his role in the community, it was given with all these things in mind. For example, the name Eve means the mother of all living, Genesis chapter three, verse 20, or life giver. Um, the name Abraham means father of many nations, which is true, right? What Abraham became the father of many nations, Genesis 17, verse five. Even the term uh, Jesus, uh, which is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua, uh, meant Jehovah saves, so very significant, very apropos name uh, for, for uh, Jesus Christ. So this focus on names is less prevalent in our society, but it's nevertheless still important. For example, how many would name your son Adolf? If you, if you had a son, a, new, a little baby, how many of you would name him Adolf? You know, I mean, there's something about Adolf, you know, thinking about Adolf Hitler in history that, that would not move you to give that name to your, to your child. Or how many would call your daughter Jezebel? 
You know, I mean, I, there are a lot of weird names out there, but I don't think a lot of people would give the name Jezebel uh, to their daughter because of the significance of evil that comes with that particular name. So even for us today, names are meaningful and they are important, but in the time of the, the, the Jews, the time of Moses, names were especially uh, significant. So uh, the name of God, therefore, the name of God, God reveals his name to the Jews and his name is Jehovah. Uh, this name in Hebrew means self-existent or eternal one. This name implies not only who God is, but also denotes his nature and his power and his authority among other things. Because he is what his name represents, the third commandment requires us to use the name as well as other, other references to him with respect. If you're, if you're referring to God, the Holy One, the Eternal One, the Self-Existent One, then you need to respect that, uh, you need to respect that name. The inference is that to use references you know, God's name without respect is to disrespect God himself and God promises to punish those who disrespect him. You know, people who have unusual or complex family names, and I can relate to that, um, if, if you make fun of their name, you make fun of them, right? It's an insult. Well, because God is supreme and unique as God, anything that lacks respect is an offense to him. And he's saying, don't do that. Those who do that uh, will be punished. Now we do this in a variety of ways, right? How do we break this command? Well, first of all, uh, using God's name to witness in frivolous matters. For example, you know, people say, well, I, I swear to God, I'll be there on time. Really? You need to take God's name as a witness just for you to be punctual? Or uh, this, is the, this is the best, whatever, chicken under heaven, right? This doesn't mean that we can't take an oath using God as our witness. Important things like marriage or, or an oath of office or in court. These are serious things. And we're asking God to witness and help us carry out our duties and our responsibilities. But we mustn't use his name to validate ourselves. You know, or validate our, our, our witness. It's a serious offense to violate an oath or a covenant that we have asked God to witness. So it's okay to use you know, God as a witness to, to serious things, but not to use his name for frivolous things. That's, that's my point here. The patriarchs in the Old Testament saw the value and seriousness of oaths and covenants so much so that they took God as witness when they made a promise or they offered a, offered a blessing. In Matthew 5, verse 37, when Jesus teaches on oaths, he is instructing the people to allow their word as Christians to be their bond in everyday matters. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no in everyday matters. Will you be there at five o'clock? Yes. Uh, you know. Uh, on Saturday, I'll need help moving. You think, you, you think you, you're sure you can be there to help me with that? Yes. That's it. You know, I swear to God I'll be there. Don't worry about it. You, you, know, you don't need to take God's name to witness in these small matters. Jesus says, let your, let your word be your bond in everyday, in everyday affairs. Um, uh, and not to take God as a witness to your everyday affairs, which would be disrespectful to him and to his name and dishonest on your part. You know, at the time of, of, of Moses, time of Jesus, merchants uh, would, would swear to God that their product or their animal was of quality. And this is what Jesus was referring to when he talked about oaths. Uh, today, same thing, maybe we're not selling animals, but you know, we, we, we use God as our witness for, for everyday things. And, and, and the, this commandment says, don't do that. That's a, that's a disrespectful thing. Another way that we break this command, using God's name in a careless or disrespectful manner. Uh, for example, using it in exclamations that are not in context of worship or study. In other words, you can't use God as an exclamation point. Things like, oh my God, you know, that's an explanation. Uh, that's an exclamation. 
we can't use God as an exclamation point. My Lord, or for God's sake, or for the love of God, or oh Jesus, or whatever. We, we can't be using these things in this way. Um, or, or using God's name in coarse ways, or using God's name to curse, or making fun of God or Christ, or swearing, you know, God damn, or using Jesus as, a, as, a, as an expletive. You, know? you can't use God's name as an expletive. Or, uh, and I think this is especially, uh, you know, where Christians are especially guilty, using God's name uh, in a euphemistic way. For example, instead of saying Jesus, we say, oh, geez. Oh, geez, we're really saying Jesus, but we're using a euphemism for Jesus. I heard people say, you know, when they're upset, Jiminy Christmas, what are they doing actually? Well, they're using an, a euphemism for Jesus Christ. And they think, well, if, if we use a euphemism, it's, it's okay, but, but we're still using the Lord's name. Words that sound like Christ. These are simply habits that we have. And, 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 and it's like anything else, you know, they sometimes are hard to break. And sometimes we don't try to break these habits because we don't realize what we're, what we're, do, uh, what we're doing. So we can't, we can't use God's name you know, as an exclamation point or as an expletive or Jesus' name or things that are, you know, that we, that are, that are sacred in our, in our, in our worship. Um, how do we keep the commandment? Uh, that's the important thing. How do we keep the commandment? Well, let's read Ephesians chapter uh, four and uh, five. In Ephesians chapter four, Paul says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. And then in another place, uh, chapter five, verse four, he says, and there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. And so basically, how do you keep the command? Well, begin by eliminating those words and phrases and vocal habits that disrespect God. Most of the time, it's just, they're just habits you know, that we pick up as we grow up and we never grow out of them. Um, and replace these words and these habits with words and phrases and vocal habits that show faith, that show uh, respect, that show gratitude. Hey, I, you know, if something great happens, I say, praise God. There's an exclamation. I'm using God's name, but I'm using it properly. Praise God when I'm happy or when I'm encouraged or amen as a confirmation or an approval of something. Look what I did, I did great, amen. Praise God, that's, that's a marvelous thing. You know, it's just a, a, change, of, a, change, of, a change of habit. Uh, another uh, passage I want to read in, you know, in the discussion of how do we keep this commandment, and this time from Isaiah. Isaiah writes, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to the other and said, holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, woe is me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. And so here Isaiah is describing the glimpse of the heavenly glory that he saw, which moved him to see the sinfulness of his lips. Now remember, Isaiah was a, an extremely pious and, and educated Jew, and yet when he was in heaven and you know, uh, in, the, in the presence of the Lord, he, despite you know, the fact that he was a pious Jew, he still considered himself a sinful, a sinful man. You know, people who don't know God are usually the ones who break this command. They have no sense of God. They have no sense of of holiness or piety. And so it's easy for them to use God's name. But if we know God, if we know him at all, 
then we're much more reluctant to be using his name in any, in any uh, frivolous or inappropriate way. And so the, the, my point here is the more you know and interact, uh, interact with God through Christ, the more that you want to honor him with your, with your lips. Uh, this is the way to overcome swearing. It's not just through, um, it's not just, uh, through willpower. Some people say, you know, oh, I'm going to willpower. I'm going to make sure I don't use that word properly, you know, and, they, and everything's fine so long as they're not mad. <laughs> or if they lose their temper and then whoop, out comes some terrible thing using the Lord's name. Well, you know, d deciding that you're going to exercise willpower uh, in order to be more selective in the words that you use and cultivating newer habits of speech, this is all good. But if you really want to obey this commandment, you have to know God more. You have to grow in your knowledge of the Lord. And as you grow in the knowledge of the Lord, you'll also grow in the knowledge of how to address Him. The more you know God's word, the more you will know which words to use when addressing God in your prayer life or when you're talking about Him. And the more you begin to appreciate God's holiness and God's goodness and God's mercy, and that appreciation uh, eventually leads you to uh, not wanting to ever use His name in a disrespectful manner. And so we, 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 we don't take the Lord's name in vain if we are continually using our lips in order to praise Him and thank Him and to tell and talk uh, to Him in Christ Jesus. Just a, a change of habit, a change of focus, a change of study helps us to keep this commandment. Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, give you the, uh, the questions that you can use uh, in your small group discussion on this topic. Question number one, what is the number one way that you have seen this commandment broken in the following areas, the media, your work or school, church, your family, and your own personal life. Question number two, how can we help others keep this command? Question number three, Write a prayer of praise that uses 100 words. Read it back to the group. 